Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we're delving into ghost stories. This is a hybrid video, which means the first several stories are new, and the last set of stories are not. If you're just here for the new stories, there's a timestamp listed in the video description for when you should stop listening. However, for the rest of you, enjoy the long ghost stories video. If you have a true paranormal story you'd like to share, you can go to ravenreadshorror.com slash pages slash story to submit yours there. You can also go to the subreddit r slash ravenreadshorror. Before we get going, a reminder that you can find links to all my channels, shops, Patreon, and anything else you might need in the video description below. And now, without further ado, you know what time it is. It's time to get comfortable, grab a beverage of choice, and get ready to take another journey into the night. catching weird vibes recently, where I feel as though somebody is around or trying to make their presence known. I hadn't seen anything weird enough to really catch my attention, until today. I've been thinking that maybe it was my mom trying to make her presence known. She passed away this past February from cancer, and it was pretty abrupt. I became her full-time caregiver when she went home on hospice, and she only lasted three months. I'm thinking maybe it's her. I also don't know how to communicate, except for praying to my mom, and who knows if it's even her. When I woke up today at six o'clock in the morning, I went over and touched my laptop bag, which is also where I keep some of my mail and my iPad. I keep this bag wide open, and on top of a bench next to the head of my bed. It leans against the wall due to how much stuff I have in it. I didn't do much to it, just made sure that I had certain mail in there and left it alone. Fast forward to about 9 a.m. I was listening to music in the living room downstairs, and I had my cat in my lap. I noticed my cat heard something from the way he got up and looked toward upstairs. Since I had my headphones on, I didn't hear anything, and I didn't think anything of it to go and stop and check it out. We also live in an apartment, so noises can often be heard throughout the day. It's nothing new. Around 11 a.m., my boyfriend and I went upstairs to get ready to go out. I noticed my laptop bag laying on the floor, a couple of inches away from the bench that I keep it on. I asked my boyfriend if he had touched it, and he said no. The way I found my bag laying didn't make any sense at all. If it had fallen off the bench, everything would have spilled out of it, since I keep it open and unzipped. The crazy part was, the things in my laptop were still perfectly in place, and the way the bag was laying on the floor appeared as if somebody had picked it up nicely and just laid it there to be found. I picked it up and put the bag back on the bench the same way I know I had left it that morning. There was no way that it had fallen over and still kept everything so neat. It was also physically impossible due to the way that the bag had been leaning against the wall. My boyfriend and I stared at each other because we were thinking the same thing. What if it was a ghost or a spirit? He told me to stop thinking too far into it because it was scaring him. But now, I can't stop questioning the logic. If it's my mother, I would be glad, but still a little spooked. I've had only two dreams with her in them since she passed. I have been yearning to somehow communicate with her. But 
I come from a background of beliefs where looking for answers beyond the veil is never a good thing, spiritually. It can open a door to something else. I've also been told that God doesn't want us to seek such answers in those ways. So, I'm really at a loss. This happened around five years ago. My niece had just turned six, and my brother asked me to allow him to throw her a birthday party at my house, as his apartment was too small. Okay, no problem. The house is all yours for the day. The party lasts for a few hours, just a regular one with cake and presents. We cleaned up and everybody left. About five minutes later, somebody rang my doorbell. I went to open it and it was my niece. I asked her what she was still doing there. I said, why didn't you leave with your parents? She answers, they forgot me, uncle. I'm hungry. Can I come inside and get more cake? Sure, kid, whatever. It's your birthday after all. I cut her a slice of the leftover cake and left her to eat it by herself in the kitchen while I went to call my brother. I asked him why he had left her behind. His answer made my heart skip a beat and my stomach drop. He said, what are you talking about? She's right next to me. I went to the kitchen and there was nobody there, just a half eaten slice of cake. Nothing paranormal has ever happened to me since, but that day will stay with me forever. I've had a lot of encounters with the paranormal, but this is by far the scariest incident. When I was a teen, I moved my bedroom into the basement. There was an enormous bedroom down there. So, despite how pitch black dark it got at night, and despite the creepy staircase leading down to it, I was happy with my setup. We had lived in that house for 10 years before this happened, and those 10 years were almost free from incident. When we'd first moved in, I was eight, and I thought something had tried to play fetch with my dog that I couldn't see, but that was only one time. Fast forward to when I was 18, and this happened. I was in a dead sleep, when suddenly I was awoken by being hit in the face with a pillow, hard. Being startled and assuming that it was my little brother, I yelled at him. I heard nothing. I had to walk to the other side of my dark bedroom to turn on the only light, a lamp near the door. There was nobody there. No brother, no pets, nobody but me. I had many decorative pillows on the bed and had been hit with one of them. I knew that because I had felt the odd texture of it hit my face. Figuring I had somehow dreamed it all, or at least trying to convince myself of that, I somehow fell right back asleep. The next night, it happened again. I knew I wasn't dreaming. I stayed frozen in my bed, not knowing what to do, but being certain that this was not good. Suddenly, I heard my bottles of nail polish slowly moving around on the fancy glass plate they sat on. The sound of glass dragging across glass was familiar and unmistakable. I bolted up, and at that second, a coin from my coin jar flew across the room and hit my nightstand. At that moment, I finally stood up to run across the room and get to the light. But before I even reached the lamp, 
something else did it for me. It started turning on and off, on and off, in rapid succession. I sat with my hand hovering in front of it, but never touching it, watching as it flicked on and off. I stood there frozen in terror, and then almost involuntarily I screamed, Mom! Like a child. I tripped falling up the stairs as I ran away from this insane scene. I cried and nearly hyperventilated to my mother, trying to explain what had happened. She didn't really know what to make of it. She didn't think that I would make anything up, but she never outright said that she thought it could be a ghost either. I never entered that room alone again, and I slept on the couch until I moved away for college. Some time later, we found out from neighbors that a young boy had died there in the 70s. We lived next to a power station, one of those ugly gray structures that generate electricity for the entire town. There wasn't always a fence around it. The boy who had lived in our house walked over there and was electrocuted. He was approximately seven to 10 years old. Thinking back on it, it seems like maybe a child spirit just wanting to play with the child who had grown up in his house years after he had passed. But my dude, that is not the way to make friends from across the spirit realm. Never before or since have I had a ghostly encounter involving so much direct physical contact, hearing things you can't account for, or seeing flickers of shadows just doesn't scare the same way as having pillows and knickknacks thrown at you in the darkness. So I'm agnostic. I don't really believe in anything spiritual or paranormal. But at the same time, I'm well aware that I don't know everything. I'm working a night shift right now, and it's almost midnight. I work in a care home. The care home consists of two buildings, the main one right next door, and a smaller one with only a few residents. I'm working in the small one tonight and I'll be the only member on staff until early morning. Both buildings are very old. And before becoming a care home, they were housing an orphanage for sick children, or children they deemed sick, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. There are still some pictures of them on the walls here and there. From what I've been told, Many of them unfortunately passed away here. About half an hour ago, I was on my way out from a bedroom when I saw what seemed to be a lady wearing a white nightdress at the other end of the hall. For a split second, I thought it was a resident who perhaps couldn't sleep. However, I soon realized that I could only see half of her body vertically as she disappeared, walking through the wall. The whole thing lasted only a couple of seconds. I froze and tried to figure out what I had just seen. Then I went outside to have a cigarette and try to calm myself down. I really don't know what to make of this. It's never happened to me before, and I'm very scared. Is there some kind of logical explanation? I'm not sleep deprived, I never hear or see things, and nothing like this has ever happened to me before. Update. I think I'm officially losing my mind. I was on my way back to the main door, I had to go out to throw some garbage away. And as soon as I walked in, I heard a man, or a woman with a deep voice, shouting, Hello? It didn't make sense because the sound came from my right-hand side, 
and it's only two women and a gentleman, but it wasn't his voice. The women have high-pitched voices. I said, hello? Back, but I got no answer. I looked in the three bedrooms that were in that direction, but every resident was fast asleep. I even went upstairs. There's only one man there who usually stays up until very late. I asked him if he had called me, but he said no. After that, I checked every room, all while looking over my shoulder. But everybody is sleeping. I'm about to cry. I only see two explanations. Either there's something or someone here who could possibly hurt me, or I've developed some kind of mental disorder out of the blue. Neither one is particularly comforting. At 19 years old, I worked at a local pizza parlor called Ciro's. I was the one up front at the register, serving drinks like beer or wine. After closing, two people were in the back cleaning and closing up, and I was up front cleaning the lobby. For context, this shop had glass windows for walls. It was dark outside, but well lit inside. You could see a total reflection in the glass at night. Well, I turned toward the window, where the counter and register are, and there's an open area behind it, which leads to the kitchen of the restaurant. I saw a translucent person standing there, in jean shorts and a red zero shirt, standard uniform. He looked kind of familiar. I thought to myself, weird, what the heck? I looked away toward the window, but I could only see my reflection, not his. I looked back, and he was gone. I didn't feel anything malevolent, but peaceful, confused, and maybe a little sad. He looked surprised to see me. We locked eyes. At that point, I went to the back, and I asked my manager, has anyone who worked here ever died? He looked me dead in my eyes, perplexed, and said, Yes, actually. His name was Andre. Why do you ask? I gestured with my thumb behind me and said, Because I just saw him. About ten years later, I was chatting with and hanging out with a friend of a friend. She started to talk about ghost stories, and I offered mine. She paled when I finished and said, I knew him. We were really close in high school. He often comes into the dreams of one of his former close friends, actually. She knew that he worked at Ciro's at the time of his death. And then it hit me, and I realized that I had known him in high school too, through mutual friends, though we weren't close. His death was mysterious, but it was ruled an accident. It was said that he was playing the choking game and died at a park tied to a tree. A jogger found him in the morning. But those closest to him say that he was murdered. The police, though, just ignored those rumors and called it an accident and moved on. I still don't know how to feel about this whole incident. I never saw him again after that. This event happened almost 20 years ago. I don't really talk about it with people because it sounds so crazy. I haven't even thought about it in a long time. But it came to me the other day, and I thought I'd share. The high school I attended was said to be haunted by a girl who had been pushed off of the bell tower and broke her neck, causing her to pass away instantly as she hit the ground. 
before it was turned into a modern day high school. I believe it was an all girls boarding school. Strangely enough, I can't find a lot of information on the building. It would have been a boarding school around the time when this unfortunate event happened. There were a few small stories circulating about the school being haunted, but alas, they could have been rumors completely made up. However, I had an experience of my own that made me believe them. I'll start with one of the stories that I heard from others. Either a teacher or a student, I forget which, needed a guide dog or a therapy dog, which they would bring to the school with them. However, the dog would refuse to go anywhere near the stairwell, which led to the bell tower. It would whine and try to back up, and it just wouldn't go toward the bottom end of the second floor, the ICT corridor, which is where the doors led out to the stairwell. It's also where I had my own experience. I'd also like to add that there is no longer a bell in the bell tower. It wasn't there when I first started at the school, and it's still not there to this day. I believe it was removed and the door leading up to it was sealed shut, meaning that even if we ascended the stairs to it, we wouldn't be able to get much farther than that. Now onto my experience. It was lunchtime and I had taken a shortcut through the math corridor, turning right into the ICT corridor on the second floor toward the door that leads to that stairwell. One set of stairs led down to a small foyer and the canteen on the right and the other set of stairs led up toward the sealed off bell tower. As I was walking along the ICT corridor, I realized that it was awfully quiet. No one was around, no teachers or students whatsoever. It was so quiet it made my ears ring. A set of footsteps joined me and were walking behind me, about halfway down along the corridor. I thought it must have been another student, so I didn't bother turning around to see who it was. I just wanted to get to lunch. I got to the doors, which are big, heavy wooden doors that don't stay open on their own. They have to be pushed with quite a bit of force and latched onto a heavy-duty magnet that holds them open, unless you press a button to release them. The amount of times I was smacked in the face by these things is astounding. So I get to the doors and I push one of them open, not bothering to latch it to the magnet on the wall, thinking that the person walking behind me will just catch it as I let go and walk through it down to the canteen for lunch too. As I began walking down the set of stairs to the canteen, I suddenly stopped mid-step. Something didn't feel right. I realized the doors hadn't made the noise that they do when they slam shut, and the footsteps had stopped at the door. I waited for someone to pass me on the stairs, but nobody did. So I turn around slowly, and the door that I walked through is stood open on its own, without being latched onto the magnet. It was ajar, far enough open that I could see down the corridor, but not quite far enough for it to catch the magnet and stay open and the student that I was sure was walking behind me was nowhere to be seen, even though I would have sworn up and down that they were right behind me. Their footsteps weren't that far away. Before I could even gasp, the door shuts, slowly, as if somebody was holding it open and then slowly and gently shut it so it wouldn't make a noise. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. I turned and ran down the rest of the steps. I never took that shortcut alone again, and I always made sure I went the long way around if no one was with me. What was even weirder to me was the fact that it felt like somebody was watching me during this whole event. It was so creepy. I've had paranormal stuff happening in my house for a few years now. I've always been able to see ghosts around and hear them. Recently though, there have been more experiences. I've heard footsteps and I've seen shadow figures way more often recently. It's always when I'm alone in my home. I hear people shout my name even though nobody else is there. I've always believed in spirits and demons. Recently, I bought this doll. It was really old and it definitely had a sense of creepiness. 
We had purchased this doll from a boot sale in the street. It's where people park their cars and you shop out of the boot or of the trunk. My stepdad and I have been the only ones to touch the doll. We both touched the doll on Tuesday this week when we were setting it up. I put it on the drawers at the end of my bed and I fell asleep. At 2.58 in the morning, I woke up feeling ill and I felt like I was being watched. I put the doll in one of the drawers as I didn't like the sense that it was giving me. My stepdad and I woke up the next day with horrible symptoms. We ended up with a non-viral bacterial tonsillitis infection. I spent the whole of Thursday in bed violently shaking from this illness. That night, my fan flew off the bedside table. It had been there for weeks and I didn't move, so there was no reason for it to move. I don't know if this is all just a big coincidence or not. I don't know if we have a haunted house, a haunted doll, or nothing. But it's definitely been weird. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six or so years of my life. It's been a long time, so I don't really truly remember it. But I know I used to live in an apartment complex near a mire. Well, we ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and there were some disturbances I remember at my young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room so that my mother and I could use it as our room. I was really afraid to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had had separate rooms, so my grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. Well, one day we were taking a break from cleaning out the room, and we were laughing out in my grandma's room. I can't remember exactly why, but my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something she had forgotten. It might have been a drink. Anyway, as I'm walking toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I've ever heard in my life. It almost sounded like something straight out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. A typical answer that a child would get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. On occasion, I would hear stuff. I would see shadows. I would sense that somebody was watching me, but I was never really truly bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that stuff was happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and keep me up some nights. But it was always interesting to me, because I truly believed my house was haunted. I liked to pretend that it wasn't though, so I could sleep at night. My mom died on November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird, and the feelings of being watched and noises and shadows increased, but nothing super significant. I always thought it was due to the fact that my grandma had like six cats, one night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night. We played video games and he in particular loved to talk to me about his dreams because they were so creative and vivid. I mean, they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep and before that I closed my bedroom door because one of the cats would come into the room all the time and wake us up by licking plastic stuff for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I was drawn to look at the bedroom door, and it slowly opens. An almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room and stays close to the ceiling. As this is happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, No! Stop! And at this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, eeriest feeling that I've ever had in my life. 
I was so scared, but also simultaneously so tired that I covered my face with my blanket and eventually just passed out. I woke up the next day and everything seemed normal. I asked my friend about last night and he said that he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. But when I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild, because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. He seemed to remember them all. There were other things that I can't remember. My dad said one night he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs and grab some food out of the fridge. When he says he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door, and he kind of stumbled back and looked, but then nobody was there. From his face when he tells this story, you can tell how sobering of an experience this had to have been. All of us, however, would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us when she hadn't. And personally, I would just freeze and look in every direction to try to find where it had come from, but sometimes she wasn't even in the house. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly until she finally called 911 and went into the ER where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer, almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what I think was like a month, she ended up passing away. And ever since that day, the house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from like level 20 to 100. Stuff was being knocked over, voices were echoing from the hallways in the basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right into your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement. The list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house that always told me that when he went downstairs to take a shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. He was still trying to figure out how I was doing it. Until one day he realized that I wasn't because I had another friend of mine come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair black. I was in that phase already, so I helped him. He went downstairs to take a shower and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing a video game. He walks in and says, how the hell did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were really puzzled until he told us that somebody had kept shaking the door handle. My friend went pale and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all scared and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my house again. Between hearing doors in the basement seeing shadows, stuff like that. My dad kept telling me how when he was home by himself, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house, which drove him back to alcoholism. Then one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat that we had had died. That was shortly before we moved out. When I say these encounters intensified, I mean it. All of my friends that came over just said that the house didn't feel right. It wasn't welcoming. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, even though at that point all the cats had passed and nobody would be there. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors. And when I'd get home, I'd go check and find that pretty much all of them were closed when nobody could have possibly been in the house. And this is just all my perspective. My friends, and my roommate especially, had their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I moved out into a new apartment, now a trailer, I haven't experienced anything else. It's been a nice change of pace, and I hope to never experience anything of that kind ever again. This happened years ago, but the memory is still very clear. 
After attending a wedding dinner, my friend drove me home. It was very late at night. We saw this old lady walking by the roadside. She was walking alone and holding an umbrella. Being as kind as he always is, my friend stopped and asked the old lady if she needed a ride. The old lady said that she was heading to the bridge just a few miles ahead. My friend asked her to hop in and she got into the back seat of the car. Then we continued to drive. A few minutes later, the weight of the car suddenly lifted. He was driving an old sedan, so if someone gets in the car, it weighs down. And if someone gets out, it lifted, and you could definitely feel it. I looked behind, and this lady had just vanished, like out of thin air. Mind you, the car was still moving when it happened. However, the old lady's umbrella was still in the back seat. I looked at my friend, and he knew what had happened too, but we didn't dare say a word. I just told him the umbrella was still there, and we continued on. When we reached the bridge, I put the umbrella on the ground, and we drove home. We never discussed it since. Because really, why would we? We both know what we saw, and we both know that we picked up a ghost that night. This happened to me when I was in the fourth grade. I moved into a new school. Someone once said to me that the stairs in that school were haunted. The story goes that one day some students were going down the stairs when they got pushed. A teacher just walked by and asked, what happened? Who pushed you? And at that exact moment, the teacher herself got pushed. Another story goes that this particular ghost was running around the hallway during assembly. Also, this ghost apparently had no arms or legs. I asked other people if this was true, and they said that it was. So I got curious, and I decided to check it out with one of my friends at break. So to get to this supposedly haunted staircase, you had to go through a door. In front of that door is another door. Open that door, and the stairs are right there. My friends and I opened the first door, and were about to open the second. But then I saw something, a shadowy figure that seemed to have no arms. My friend saw it too, so we ran out the back door to the playground. Now you might say that it could have just been a shadow of someone else, but the figure was standing right in the middle of the stairs, not against a wall or anything like that. I never used those stairs again, unless I was walking with a teacher or a group of people. To this day, I still wonder if I imagined it or if that thing was really there. I have absolutely no memory of this experience, but my mom does, and she told me the story. I was a little over two years old and had just started to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago, when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until Judgment Day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman, who always talks way too loudly, was literally whispering by the end of it. And she was white as a sheet. I believed her completely, and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, who we'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to the town from there. 
My mom said the first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean house, ugly house, don't like, scary house, mama, don't like. My mom says this behavior was extremely out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, causing a lot of damage. A lot of this damage wasn't fixed, so my young broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement, gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed that the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level. Either way, the landlord was adamant that that room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, 100%. I know all of this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it, and both of my parents have told me that it did give them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our Pitt Doberman mix boss. She was hanging laundry and I was just rolling around with a dog. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, Boss started going absolutely ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, then turning and running back to the pond, barking frantically the whole time. That's when my mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and drug me out of the water himself. Thanks, Popper. Love you. Although my mom was confused as to how I'd gotten so far so fast, and how I had ended up in the center of the pond, since it was way over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she just underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and playpens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen to hear us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said that no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us. Victor's still sleeping. Every baby gate is shut and locked, but I am not in my room. A frenzied search revealed that I wasn't in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning caused my mom to rush outside to see what he was trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother and wait for her to catch up a little before racing off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from the neighbors. He led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said that she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, 
had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, I was just standing. She rushed over to me, and after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began questioning me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking at a very young age, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look that only small children can give, that the children had brought me there. Shitting her pants a little at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her, through the kitchen, get me from upstairs, walk right back past her on the way down the stairs and out with me all the way over here, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they were now. I looked at her dead serious and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs, I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there, staring at her, with a serious expression and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering, and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was flat impossible. She says there's no way I could have even known it was out there, much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs, past her, and end up almost two miles down the road, all in under 15 minutes. I was only two, and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers. As I said, she's still shaken by it after 30 years. Personally, I have no idea what happened that day. I've thought about hypnosis, but haven't decided if I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever those things were, I really don't think they were children. I'm pretty sure my roommate's house is haunted, but they don't believe in ghosts or souls very much, so they don't think much of the weird things that happened around here. You can clearly hear footsteps in the attic. I used to live in an apartment, so you can definitely tell what different sounds you hear. With that, they are very distinctly the footsteps of someone pacing in the attic. There's only one way in or out of it in my roommate's room, so I know it isn't some squatter or something like that. Things in the house move around on their own, too. It happens in front of my friend and I a lot, to the point where we're kind of used to it. Even though we're used to it, though, I would be more at peace with it if I knew more about the spirits here. Any attempt to contact them has failed, so I assume they just don't want to talk. I haven't had any negative encounters with them, though. The worst I've had is probably knocking over some stuff on the couch. Still, I just want to know what I'm living with. Is that too much to ask? Redditor's psychological aunt, 8611, posted a story that happened to him on a hiking expedition. Here it is. As a young man, I loved to climb mountains. This is an amazing encounter that occurred to me on one climbing expedition. We had left a hut late one night. The intention was to summit a mountain in a single long push by climbing right through the night. It was bad weather in the middle of winter and there was deep snow we were trying to find our way through a maze of crevasses on a glacier. I remember the howling winds and clouds moving rapidly through the sky as the bulk of the mountain loomed over us. 
there was a full moon, which would hide behind the clouds before emerging again. I remember seeing a man moving up the slope from below us. The first thing that struck me was that he didn't have a headlamp on. I yelled over the wind at my climbing partner. Let's go talk to this guy. What guy? He shouted back. That guy, I said, pointing down at the figure moving toward us. There was a pause. What guy? At this point, I remember losing it. That freaking guy right there. He's right there. And at that point, I looked back down to see absolutely nothing. Thinking he had fallen into a crevasse, we walked down, but we never found any tracks. There was no trace of anyone. In the years since, I have heard reports of similar encounters in that area. In fact, recently, the bones of a deceased climber from the 1970s were discovered, melted out of the ice. The news report reminded me of my mysterious climber from that night, and it just makes me wonder. I'm a middle school teacher and coach in a rural area outside of San Antonio, Texas. As a part of my coaching contract, I have to get my CDL and bus my athletes to and from games. After our last game of the volleyball season, I was driving the bus back to the bus barn. It was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, so it was already super dark and there weren't many cars out. But I've driven this part a million times, and I was just excited to return the bus and get home to my husband and dogs. The bus I had wasn't anything special. It was just an old sub bus from 2004. There are cameras inside that don't record audio, apparently, and a few switches were broken. But as long as the brakes worked and the bus got as close to 50 miles per hour as it could, it was perfect. I was approaching a bridge when a whispering voice began to speak through the radio. This didn't surprise me much because there's usually an interference near this bridge due to it being near the train tracks. Plus lots of cops hide here to catch speeders. I wasn't really familiar with the way these radios worked, but it helped me feel better about it. The closer I got to the bridge though, the louder the whisper through the radio was. I began to make out words like slow, sit, and no. As soon as I started to go underneath the bridge, I did a mirror check just to make sure I had enough room on the sides. Everything seemed normal, until I looked in the inside mirror that could see all of the seats behind me. Sitting in the very back row on my right was a figure. It was pure black just a black abyss sitting straight up in the seat as if it was one of my athletes. At first I thought it was a shadow, but as the bus moved, it stayed put, unlike the shadows around it. After about five seconds, as I pulled away from the bridge, the figure vanished. The voice on the radio had paused, but then I clearly heard it say in a static low voice, turn around. I snapped my eyes forward, terrified, and pressed the gas a little harder, praying that I could get this old bus to go faster. The bus bar and gate was open and about 50 yards away, and I only stopped when I parked the bus. I did a quick sweep of the inside to make sure that nobody had stowed away and that this was some kind of prank, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I asked the other coaches the next day if they had ever had any weird experiences around the bridge, but they said no. I'm going to ask the coaches at the other schools as well. I did get a chance to tell this story to one of the bus drivers that I get to see most mornings during the AM drop-off. He's an older driver who's been around since 2001. 
He mentioned that gangs used to race down that stretch of road all the time back in the early 2000s. One day, a race ended in a fiery crash just before the bridge, and a young man lost his life. The bus driver had heard similar stories to mine about the radio near the bridge, but never had anybody said that they had seen an apparition before. I asked if he knew of somebody I could contact to see the footage from the camera on the bus, but he laughed and said that they would probably think I was crazy and drug test me on the spot. This was the scariest experience I've ever had driving a bus. I pass that bridge every day on the way to work and it just gives me chills. I don't have to drive a bus again for another three months, but I'm already dreading it. I worked the late shift for this company about six years ago. I would get off at midnight and the company bus would take us home. My neighborhood was the farthest, so I would be brought home last. I should also mention that the road that this happened on has had multiple strange incidents, accidents, murders, ghostly sightings, strange creatures, just a whole lot of weird stuff. On the last part of the journey, there were three of us left on the bus. After the driver confirmed our addresses, we continued. I was at the front of the bus. A young lady in the middle and a guy at the back were the other two passengers. We got to the guy's street and the driver stopped and waited for him to get off. After getting impatient, the driver asked the lady to go check if he was sleeping. She came running back to the front of the bus, crying and praying. We asked her what was wrong, and she said that there was nobody back there, and she wanted to go home right now. The driver switched on the lights and floored it. It gets even creepier. After getting off on my street, I began to walk to my house. This was now at about two o'clock in the morning. Every dog that I would walk past kept staring at something behind me. When I turned to look, there was nothing. There was no shadow, no sound, no body. After getting inside my house, I looked out the window for the next 10 minutes. It was just dead silence and dogs staring at nothing. I've never been able to figure out what happened that night, but it was freaky. I grew up in a house that was built in 1902. I was born in the late 80s, so the house had been remodeled a few times. It was a two-story house with three bedrooms and a tiny bathroom on the second floor. The bathroom was at the top of the stairs and my room was across the hall at kind of an angle. My sister and my parents had rooms farther down a long, narrow hallway. For as long as I can remember, I saw a ghost I called her Pam. My mom told me that I began talking about Pam around the age of five and that I never stopped. My mom never believed any of this and just brushed it off as my wild imagination. Pam was pink and transparent, a see-through, totally pink little girl, maybe eight or nine years old. She knew that I could see her and I knew that she could see me, but she never made a sound, ever, nothing. She walked around only the upstairs and never came down the steps. Honestly, I have no idea where the name Pam came from. Growing up, Pam would sit at the top of the stairs, waiting for me to run up to the bathroom after I got home from school. I would walk around her because she was always there, every day. If she wasn't sitting on the step, she would just be sitting on a bed or standing in one of the rooms or the hallway harmless for the most part. However, if I ignored her, she would mess up my bedroom while I was gone doing my paper route. 
When I would get back home, my parents would be all sorts of angry over my messy room. But if I just said a quick hi, she wouldn't mess with me. She never touched me, and I also never physically saw her move anything with my own eyes. But I would get really scared and nauseous every time she would destroy my room behind my back. So I learned very quickly to say hi to her every day. At the age of 15, my mom put me into therapy because I was still bringing up Pam here and there. Pam was still always around. I was used to her and she wasn't doing anything. So she didn't come up in conversations as often. Therapy helped, but not with Pam. When I was 17, my parents decided to put our house up for sale. I don't know if it was all the people walking through or me packing up my stuff, but something triggered Pam and it got real crazy. About a month before our new house was built and ready to be moved into, I was asleep in my room. My bed was against the wall and I could lie on my side and see right into the bathroom. While asleep, I had a dream of Pam, still transparent, standing in the doorway of the bathroom. She pointed up and for the first time in my life, I heard her talk. She said, look, that's my mom. I sat up in bed and from the light fixture saw a dark haired woman hanging lifelessly by a rope. Her boot fell off of her foot and hit the floor and I woke up. Holy crap. I couldn't say anything because my family never saw her. They didn't understand. Pam wasn't in their lives like she was in mine. I didn't really dwell too much on it. It was a dream, right? Pam was back to sitting on the top step the next day, life as usual. But two weeks later, I had another dream. It started out exactly like the first one. The bathroom light was on and I could kind of see into it while laying down on the bed. But this time I heard a weird grunting and splashing. I sat up and saw clear as day, the woman that had been hanging from the light fixture was not only alive, but was holding Pam, no longer translucent, under the water in our bathtub. She was drowning Pam in our bathtub. I don't have any idea what made me wake up, but I could not contain my emotion. I ran down the hall and jumped into my parents' bed as a 17 year old. It was just my mom in there. I think my dad fell asleep on the couch or something, but I was hysterical. I told my mom everything through tears and gasps for air. My mom didn't know what to say. Then in the middle of my sadness, Pam walked into the door frame of my parents' bedroom. She was transparent again. I quickly laid down really close to my mom and pulled the covers over my head. I just remember saying, Oh my gosh, mom, she's in here. I held my breath and seconds later, I felt cold, small hands on my back, shoving me against my mom. I kept yelling, stop touching me. My mom could only reply with, I'm not touching you. This went on for what felt like forever, but was probably only a matter of seconds. When she stopped, she just stood there at the side of the bed, staring at me. She didn't move. I pulled the covers over my head again, and I ended up crying myself to sleep while my mom held me. We were both shaking horribly. I moved all of my stuff out the next day, and I slept on the floor of our unfinished house the next few nights until my bedroom was done. I never went back. Shortly after my family moved out completely and before the next buyers moved in, the entire back of the house and the entire garage went up in flames. The official cause was listed as spontaneous combustion. The first people to buy and sell the house after us lasted 10 months there. They called my parents to tell them that they couldn't keep the window or closet door shut in the room with the black carpeting. That was my bedroom. I saw the house posted a couple of months ago on Zillow and the only picture of my room shows the door open a crack. You can see a bit of the black carpeting, but there's nothing in the room. The rest of the house is furnished. I've tried so hard to find any information about the girl that's in my old house. 
but there's almost no information at all. Just basic architecture and lot line documents. It's the craziest story, but this was my childhood. Part of me feels sorry for Pam, but another part of me knows that there's something strong and dark in that house. I know Pam loved me in a way, but there's no way I would ever go back. In August of 2019, my mom got sick. She had a stroke, has diabetes, and so on. So the first time that my mom got sick, my brother was the one who stayed with her. And the second time she got sick, I stayed with her, mostly because my brother couldn't be patient enough to take care of her again. My mom was being placed in a room that could fit six patients. There was this one time that I went to the canteen and I bought like food and stuff like that. When I was in the elevator, a guy came in, so it was just the two of us. After I bought some things from the canteen, I went back using the same elevator, and I accidentally met the same man again, with the same elevator, just the two of us in it. We talked a little bit before the elevator opened. When it did, we heard some people screaming and crying. He asked me, what happened? Why are they screaming and crying like that? I said, I don't know, maybe a patient just passed away. If yes, may they rest in peace. I barely heard him say, thank you, like whispering. I didn't really pay any attention to it. I said goodbye to him and I walked to my mom's room. After a little bit of conversation, I went back to my mom's room and the crying and screaming voice was actually from that room. So I was kind of curious about who the person was that had passed. The nurse opened the curtain to prepare to move the body, and I was absolutely frozen. The person who had died was the guy that was talking to me in the elevator, and who had asked me what had happened. After that day, I had nightmares for a week, and now I'm always pretty paranoid whenever I go into an elevator. I don't know if this story is interesting to anyone else, but it definitely shook me up. For our next story, Redditor The Odd News shares a fascinating tale about a coal mine and the ghost he encountered within it. Here's the story. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, a father, and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than a true elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine. After working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we get into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What we called an engine can be considered to be a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then, there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. 
when I approached the place where the sound was coming from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person, like from a faucet. At that moment, I went into like a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, that bottom of the shaft, and sent him to the hospital. I still couldn't get over the shock of that image. That day, the person that was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology was turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during the impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if somebody was still lying in that water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside there. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work in the area of the mine where we were all working in. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area. I said to myself, I'll just rest a little where I'm sitting and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from up ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There is no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later, like me, I said to myself. That light that was approaching suddenly disappeared. Oh my gosh, where did this man go? I thought. Then I just thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away and me not see them. For this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anybody about what happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out, Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming toward me slowly. I felt such a strong sense of fear, and I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow. A silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech, not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically. And then he disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I never believed it. At that moment, all those stories that I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told what had happened to me to the Imam of the village where I lived, the Imam did believe me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. 
As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. Most probably, that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After my visit to the Imam, and after that day, I never slept in the mine again. When I was little, maybe around seven or so, I had my first paranormal experience. My mom always told me that she felt like I attracted things from the spiritual realm, even as a baby. But this experience is the first one that is my own memory, and I remember it vividly, now at 26 years old. My mom was unlucky enough to have not only my father die, but also my little sister's father. My dad passed away due to a car accident, and my sister's dad had committed side after a battle with severe depression. Needless to say, my mom had it pretty rough, and being a single working mother, she would often take us to a family friend who babysat us while she worked late nights at the hospital. The woman who babysat us was a warm, kind, and gentle woman named Rhonda. She always took the best care of us, and my sister and I really enjoyed staying with her. Rhonda had two birds who we loved to talk to. They would repeat simple things like, hello and what's up. We thought it was the coolest thing. After a long day of playing, my sister and I were off to bed and Rhonda tucked me into bed in her spare room downstairs. My sister was still pretty little and she slept in the same room as Rhonda because she was too scared to sleep alone. And Rhonda was like a grandma to us who was more than happy to share her bed if we got scared. I was a big girl, and I loved having my own room to sleep in. I was never scared. On this night, though, I was having trouble falling asleep, and I just kept tossing and turning, growing frustrated that I wasn't asleep. And for some reason, I began to get anxiety and become fearful. I didn't know why I was scared, but I was. After what felt like forever of me just laying there, contemplating getting up and crawling into Rhonda's bed, I heard something in a low, calm male voice say, Marissa, it's okay, just go to sleep. This surprised me, but it didn't scare me. I believe that as a child, you're more open and susceptible to paranormal things due to the fact that you're not conditioned to be fearful yet. With age, you learn what's scary and all the things that go bump in the night that you should run away from. But I was still so innocent that I didn't register this as threatening at all. Actually, it calmed me down and I started to feel very tired and I just accepted what the voice told me and went to sleep. The next morning, Rhonda made us breakfast as she always did. She sat across from me and sipped her coffee. I always asked her for a sip of it, because if I wasn't already a strange child, I also had a taste for coffee. She asked me how I slept, and I told her that I was scared, but that somebody had told me to go to sleep. She looked at me confused, and she asked me if I had had a dream that somebody was talking to me. But I told her, no, I was awake. She said it was probably the birds talking again, and I told her I was sure that it wasn't. She then asked me if it was a man's voice or a woman's voice, and when I instantly said it was a man's voice, her face changed from the usual cheery, warm expression to put off and uncomfortable. I had never seen her face look like that before, and I think that's why I remember this so vividly. She very quickly changed the subject and we went about our day, and I didn't think about that again for years. Fast forward into my teens, 
my mom and I were having a discussion about the paranormal because I had had a lot of strange activity happening. She asked me what the very first experience I remember was that I thought was paranormal. I shared the story about the man's voice at Rhonda's house and how odd Rhonda's reaction had been. My mom looked at me and her eyes widened a bit. Rhonda had gone MIA a few years later and unfortunately she just slowly lost contact with us. Eventually she was no longer a part of our lives. I hadn't seen her in years. When my mom collected her thoughts, she looked at me and said, Marissa, you know Rhonda's son died in that room, right? I did not. I knew she had had a son who'd passed away of a tragic overdose, but I was so young that I had never met him. So I didn't really think anything about it. I looked back at my mom and we just didn't have anything to say. We were both thinking the same thing. If I was hearing a spirit speak to me, there's a good chance it could have been her son. From what my mom said about him, he was very kind and caring, much like his mom. Maybe that's why I wasn't afraid when he, if he, spoke to me. I'm not saying this is factually what happened, but it does make me wonder. The voice I heard was real, that much I do know. Regardless of who it belonged to, it's sure to me that that much is true. Since that experience, I've had many more, and unfortunately, they got much more sinister as I got older. It got very, very dark for a while, and I witnessed things that you usually only see in horror movies. I still think of this experience often, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Regardless, it's not something I'm likely to forget anytime soon. I don't have many memories of my father because he died when I was just eight years old. However, I do clearly remember the night several years later when he let us know that he was still around and watching over us. First of all, you need to know something about my father. He was fascinated by the supernatural and by the possibility of some sort of existence after death. After it became clear, that he would soon lose his battle with lymphatic cancer, he told my mother not to worry. He said, if there's any way for me to reappear after I die, to let you know that I'm okay, then that's what I'm going to do. I'll visit you and the kids all the time. It's gonna be so cool. My mother said her response to that was a pointed and succinct, don't you effing dare. It wasn't that she didn't care what happened to him after he died, or that she didn't want him watching over us. She just knew that she wasn't going to be able to emotionally deal with that situation, and she promised him that that's how she would react. My father followed through on his promise. The story my mother told us was that she was in their upstairs bedroom a few months after his death, thinking about him and crying because she missed him so much. Then she suddenly had the distinct feeling that she was being watched. She turned her head and saw my father standing outside the bedroom window on the balcony, clear as day. He looked healthy and alive. He was wearing a bright blue suit and gave my mother a look that said, is it okay if I come inside? My mother said she stared at him for a moment in total shock. She deliberately blinked her eyes to make certain that she was really seeing what she was seeing. And when she opened her eyes, he was still there, smiling and waiting. That's when my mother followed through on her promise. She closed her eyes tightly and said out loud, I can't handle this. I'm sorry, but I need you to go away and please don't ever do this again. After about 10 seconds, she opened her eyes and this time he was gone. This next part of the story takes place a few years later and I kind of have to set the scene for you. I took a bad fall while playing soccer and the impact totally destroyed my shoulder. I broke it in two places and every ligament and tendon was torn. 
The reason that this is important to the story is that my shoulder hurt so bad I couldn't easily walk up the stairs to my bedroom, which was across the hall from my parents' bedroom. I was temporarily sleeping in the guest bedroom downstairs, and my brother had the bedroom we shared all to himself. That bedroom was right above the guest bedroom. In the hallway outside the guest bedroom, there was a sideboard with shelves on top and drawers below, and on those shelves was an old mantel clock. It looked a lot like somebody cut off the very top part of a typical grandfather clock, and it was small enough to fit neatly on the shelf. The clock had to be wound every so often with a special key, which was kept in one of the drawers below. And when it was properly wound, the small pendulum would swing back and forth to keep the clock going. My dad loved this clock, and while he was alive, he made sure to wind it so that it never stopped. After his death, though, my mother never wound the clock again, and it eventually did stop. So this clock had been completely silent for years. Late one night, I was trying to go to sleep, but the pain of my injured shoulder was terrible and it was keeping me awake. Plus, as a kid, I had terrible anxiety. Even with the bedroom door closed to help me feel more secure, I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the unfamiliar surroundings of the guest bedroom and being the only person downstairs. Just as I was finally feeling like I might be able to sleep, I heard something in the hallway outside the bedroom door. I was immediately freaked out and wide awake because my mother and brother were still upstairs. The stairs in this house were very squeaky and I knew for a fact that I had not heard anybody walking down them. It sounded as though someone or something was messing around with the sideboard. First, I heard a drawer open and then shut. After that, I heard a loud click followed by a strange sort of grinding sound. Then there were a couple of more clicks, and suddenly, the clock that hadn't made a sound in years started ticking. That sound I heard before wasn't grinding, it was winding. Someone took the key out of the drawer, opened the clock, wound it, and started the pendulum. Apparently, they also put the key back in the drawer where it belonged, because that's where we found it later. At this point, 11-year-old me was not only wide awake, but I was also scared as hell and hiding as far beneath my covers as I could go with a broken shoulder. After all, when you're a child, covers are magical and repel all things evil, right? The next thing I heard was somebody walking up the stairs. Then everything was quiet for a short while. Soon though, I heard footsteps moving around all over the upstairs. I even heard someone directly above me open and close the creaky sliding closet doors in my bedroom. After that, I clearly heard footsteps come down the stairs, someone open and then close the door to the guest room where I was struggling to breathe inside my cover cave, and then soon after, the footsteps returned up the stairs, and finally all was silent, except for one thing. The clock continued with its relentless tick, Talk, tick, talk. Eventually, sleep caught up with me, and I didn't wake until my mother came to check on me in the morning. While we were eating breakfast that morning, my mother looked at me and paused for a long time. Finally, she asked, Were you up and walking around last night? I told her I was not, and then I described to her all the noises I had heard. My mother told me she heard noises during the night too, and had searched all over the house to see who it was. It was her walking all around upstairs, opening and closing the squeaky closet, coming down the stairs, opening and closing the guest bedroom door, and then going back up. So who made the other sounds we both heard first, we wondered. And why was that clock ticking? Suddenly my mother's eyes grew wide. Oh my goodness, she said. Last night was the anniversary of the night your dad died. I think it must have been him trying to let us know that he's still watching over us. And with that, we both went to look at the clock, which was still ticking. Thanks, Dad. Message received. We love you too, and we miss you.
When I was eight to 10 years old in the mid 1990s, my mom worked at a carpet company near Beaufort, Georgia. The building had a storefront where customers could walk through and look at the samples. And in the back, there was a huge warehouse where all kinds of flooring was stored. There was a loading and unloading area with large bay doors that opened up to a concrete loading lot. The loading lot was against an overgrown wooded area, but the area still had rural housing dotted here and there. So you could see the backs of a few houses a bit of ways through the woods. In general, the building always gave me the creeps. I would run around the huge hanging carpets in the warehouse while my mom was working up front. One day, while I was waiting for my mom to get off work, the big bay doors were opened, so I went out in the loading area to play outside. After a few minutes, I heard what sounded like a train coming down the tracks. Of course, when you're a kid, you get really excited about that stuff. So I ran out a little farther into the loading lot. Sure enough, I heard a train horn and I could see a train coming down the tracks from the right of the building. I put my hands over my eyes to shield them from the sun so I could see better. And I watched this robin egg blue, shiny metal train coming down the track. I remember seeing a lot of rivets. At the time I called them screws because I didn't know what rivets were. On the train and windows that came down, not up. Specifically, I saw people sitting in it, and especially a lot of ladies, with these kind of round looking hats, and a kid running down the middle of the train car. I saw a man smoking a pipe, and I remembered thinking, must be in the smoking section. To give you a better idea, the train front was rounded, and the cars were rectangular. The robin egg blue was in some details, like one of the panels under each window, stripes going up the front, and a few other small areas. The rest was really shiny, like metal. It seemed like one long train, because the cars were attached really close together. I watched this train pass by, and I was really excited about it. It seemed like my mom came out almost right after it passed to tell me she was ready to leave. I said, I saw the train, it just passed by. She was really confused and told me that there were no trains that passed there. I lamented that there most definitely was a train and I told her everything about it. She said, there's no train that can even come back here. The train tracks end right down there. I seriously thought she was pulling my leg. So I laughed and I said, uh-uh. I ran down there and sure enough, the train track ran out of track just around a bend that wasn't visible from the lot. I swore to her that I had just seen the train pass by and she swore, of course, that I was making it up. As I thought about it, I couldn't really say that I saw any specific facial features of the people on the train though. I remembered the hats, the kid, the pipe smoking, but I couldn't remember what a single face looked like. I kind of dropped it because, yeah, the tracks clearly ended and a train couldn't have gone through. But I brought it up to her and explained the detail of the train again in recent years. She thought I had made it up and couldn't believe the details. But I remember all these years later. And I think she kind of got spooked by it because she finally admitted that she also felt creepy in that building sometimes. Back in 2019, my girlfriend and I went on a vacation to an island in Italy. Everything went well except that the last day it did rain a little bit. It didn't rain a lot though. The streets were dry, but the sky was gray and we came back to our little house at about 5 p.m. because of the weather. We got bored pretty quickly and we had to wait at least three or four hours before going to eat at a restaurant. So I decided to visit the only part of the island I hadn't seen. 
We got on the motorbike and went to Calafonte, which I found out was totally abandoned due to a collapse that had happened in 2017. The whole neighborhood was as neglected and deserted as the beach and the restaurant were. And I swear we passed through every house, road, or parking lot. And it was just deserted. Nobody lived there, not even a tourist or a car. I think that the collapse of the beach made that spot a little bit less interesting. Anyway, I kept driving in that neighborhood until I ended up at a dead-end street near a football field. But there were two kids playing football on the end of the street, and people noticed that every house nearby was shut close. Not a single sign of a human being for kilometers, so where did these two kids come from? We got close, and my girlfriend and I were already a little bit freaked out. But I wanted to talk to them, because if I remember correctly, I was looking for a place that I couldn't find, and I thought perhaps they would know where it was. We approached them. They were no more than six or seven years old, dirty as hell, like just came out of a coal mine dirty. One kid had a white, more like a gray, dirty and torn t-shirt and the other only had his rag-like pants on. Both of them were without shoes and with their hair completely shaved. The shirtless kid had a circular wound, more like a hole right in the middle of his pectorals. It was red, bloody, and new, like he had just been shot in the middle of the chest. I asked them this thing and they answered me, but I couldn't understand a thing. It wasn't like the local dialect or any Italian dialect at all. It was completely incomprehensible. They kept talking and pointing at my bike. We couldn't understand a thing, so we just said goodbye and made a U-turn. I could see them staring at us from my mirrors. We were so freaked out. They looked pretty injured, but they were acting super casual. I don't know why, but my girlfriend and I are pretty sure they were some kind of ghost. Like maybe kids that died in the World War or something like that. I don't know if it's a proper paranormal encounter, but it's the only story that I still can't explain. I'm a 30-year-old man, blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like boxer from Animal Farm. I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before. All of it going in through one earbud, while I have the other ear open paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life, so needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk, and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, it reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. 
all I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at the store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. So my family and I moved into a new house, which is a two by four house. It used to have an attic, but it's been sealed off. After a couple of months into living in this house, sometimes I would be watching TV and hear scratching from the roof. I just played it off as birds are very common where I live. After about three weeks, the scratching got worse and more frequent. It's like something's trying to scratch its way out of the roof. The attic entrance thing is above the outside of my sister's room. One day, my sister tells my dad that the seal is open. My dad gets confused because it was supposed to be sealed off. My dad goes to close it and realizes that it's really hard to open and close. So whatever opened it had to be strong. And that's when I started to get skeptical. The same night, I went to get some snacks from the fridge. I opened it to find out that they were gone. I figured that my siblings must have eaten them. In the morning, my parents are going on and on about a missing cake. That cake was supposed to be for my niece's birthday. They asked if I had anything to do with it, and I said no, along with my siblings. I was getting really suspicious about the attic. So one day, I built up the courage to go check it out. Note that I am probably the most paranoid person in the world, so I was scared for my life, but my curiosity got the best of me. I get the ladder, a torch, and a knife just in case. I open the thing up and I shine my torch to see nothing. But as I search more, I see the cake, empty snack packets, dirty clothes, and a short, dark silhouette that freezes in its spot. Immediately I bold and scream for my parents and I tell them everything. They tell me to stay in my room. They go up and check, but he was gone. I am still shaken up about that moment and I get nightmares from it to this day. We've since moved from that house and haven't had any more issues like that. And we live a normal, non-scary life, but I think that day will live with me forever. Over the course of two years, I've had weird dreams about a very specific creature lurking in the attic. It always felt malevolent. Now, I don't know if it's an actual thing or my subconscious messing with me, but it deeply unsettled me in ways that my dreams almost never do. As somebody who is always aware that they're dreaming, even dreams where I'm being hunted down don't scare me, but this does. There have been so many dreams about it, but a few stick in my head. The least threatening one was a dream where I'm playing video games in my room. I glance out of my bedroom door and I see an arm dangling from the open attic. The hand moves like it's beckoning me to come closer. I don't because obviously, 
but I watch it. It never leaves the attic, but it keeps trying to get me to go to it. Another dream, I'm in a house I've never been in. My sister and nieces are in this house with me, and I get the impression that this thing is threatening my family. I'm angry, so I get vocally aggressive. I get my family out of there and go back to confront the thing. I see it for the first time in all the dreams that I've had. It was a woman with light purple skin and dreadlocks. I don't remember how this dream ended, but there were more dreams after, never including my family again, just me. The most intense encounter I had was a dream where the attic was right above the bed I was sleeping in. I was lying there, very aware that it was watching me. I figured if I ignored it, it would go away. Wrong. It slowly pulled the covers off of me. After a few minutes of lying there, cold, trying to decide if it was safe to pull the blanket back up, it grabs me by the throat and lifts me up about a foot off the bed and starts choking me. I felt like my lungs were going to burst when it let go and let me fall back onto the bed, gasping for breath. I don't know how many dreams I've had since this one, but I know it's been at least a year since I dreamt about it. I'm very uneasy around attics now, and I always expect to look up and see it again when I pass underneath one, awake or not. Even right now, I keep throwing glances at the attic door right outside my bedroom. Nothing's there, of course, but it's still on my mind. If this thing is not my subconscious and it's an actual entity, I have no idea what it could be. In my limited experience with the paranormal, I've never encountered anything that felt malevolent before. Just this. My hope is that either my brain just decided it wanted to be terrified of addicts, or that this thing got bored with me and left me forever. I have a weird story to tell you, but I promise that it's true. This happened about 10 years ago. It was at night. My older sister and I were on the second floor, spending the evening with our oldest brother and his wife. I can't recall what we were chatting with them about, but after a while, about 10 o'clock, my sister and I decided that it was time to go to sleep. We're heading downstairs. My brother has a switch right next to his main front door, into the stairs, that controls the light of the attic, where the stairs come to an end. We usually just put useless stuff there. It's a very small room. The rest of it is just flat, empty roof. So as we're heading down, we notice that this light was on in the attic, so I switched it off. Then, both my sister and I heard the exact voice of my mom saying, Turn on that light, I'm up here. Now, we were both certain that it was my mom and that it was coming from upstairs, so we didn't say anything and I turned it back on. We headed downstairs and that's when we both were totally shocked. As we opened the door to find my mom drinking tea with my other brother and the TV on, we froze, unable to move or speak. My mom noticed that something strange was going on, so she asked us what was wrong. After a moment of silence, we explained what happened. She didn't say anything, but told us to go to sleep. Of course, I couldn't. I kept thinking about what had happened the entire night. Who or what made that sound, and how did it do it? I mean, among all voices, the one of my mom is the one that I know the best, the one I grew up with, so how could it mimic it? well enough to fool both my sister and I. To this day, whenever I ask my sister if she remembers what happened, she says, yes, and then immediately changes the subject. Almost every single night, I walk up to the attic to chill in there or whatever, and I've never stumbled into anything weird. Just that one instance, but who knows?
This happened when I was around 9 or 10. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before, and we'd been inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house, surrounded by woods and dirt road. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off. The paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of crap now that I think about it, but at the time, I was excited. I remember walking in after staring at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside, so I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around just to explore my surroundings, but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there, staring at me, wide-eyed. I had never met her before, but why was she staring at me like that? Suddenly, Kat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Kat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off, and she was gone. Fast forward a couple of hours, Kat and I are laying on a beanbag in her room watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King or any movie that my mom was watching at the time. Not her decision, but mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way, and that's why we clicked so much. Anyway, we were sitting here watching this movie, and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped and giggled and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not seconds after the first time. Now I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how in the world it's opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is Kat's mom, which I figured out earlier in the day was also just a tad creepy. Do you think it's just your mom? I asked, but she just shook her head. Are you sure? I asked again, but this time she said something that gave me the chills and still does. She said, my mom isn't home. It's just me and you, silly. I just stared at her, trying to wrap my head around what she had just said. Who leaves their nine-year-old home alone with a friend in a two-story house? Where's your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was just trying to trick me. No, she's at work. She only works for a couple of hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. At this point, I'm just looking at her, and she noticed this look of worry on my face. What's wrong? She asked. I said, if your mom is at work, then who was that lady staring at me earlier? As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time, but thinking about it now, it sounded more like shuffling in one spot above us. I'm completely scared at this point, Every hair on my neck is standing on end, and I just want to leave. I start to get up when Kat pulled me back down and asked me if I heard that noise. I nodded. It was silent again, until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both stared up at the ceiling, and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I looked over at her and I could see true fear on her face. The footsteps stopped and she looked at me, her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking over and over. You ever notice when you're really quiet, that's when you can hear almost everything around you? Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old, and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no siblings. We were completely alone. Kat was just as scared as I was. 
I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of this house. I grabbed her and ran out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside the house than we would in it. Want to hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back into reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids, and one day she just locked them all in the attic. And then, she hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty, and no one found them for months afterwards. In this house. My heart started to pound, my eyes wide with fear, and I just looked at her. It's true, she said. I've seen them, the little kids, every day. But I've never seen the lady. But you have earlier. After she told me this, I don't remember much else except running out the door of her room and making it outside. Cat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to get out. My stomach felt like knots. I felt as though I had walked into a horror movie, and I just wished the day had never happened. Fast forward years later, that was the last day I had ever seen or heard from Cat. I remember her always coming to play outside at my dad's during the day. I remember what she looked like. I never remembered meeting her parents or seeing them out in public. I'm now 27 and I can't seem to find any proof that she exists. All my friends that I was friends with then, I'm still friends with now even after all these years. But why not her? I think her scary story might have had some flaws but I still wonder what happened in that house. I've driven by there maybe 15 times, and I still wonder if maybe she was one of the ones that never made it out. When I was younger, in about the fourth grade, I lived in Germany. My father was in the military, so we lived on the military base, and that is where I met my best friend at the time. Let's just call her MK. MK and I's parents noticed that we would always play together and we would have playdates. Eventually, MK and I brought our families together and we would all hang out. MK had two older sisters and a little brother while I have an older and a younger brother. MK and her family lived off base in the local part of Germany, so they lived amongst the non-English speaking, well, German people. Of course, the house MK lived in was old, really old. I would stay the night over there all the time. One night, for some reason that I can't remember, MK and I decided to sleep on the floor in the bedroom that she shared with the second oldest sister. Let's call her B. B was in the room with the oldest sister and let MK and I have the other bedroom to ourselves. So anyway, this night we're sleeping on the floor a few feet away from their beds. I remember waking up in the middle of the night to the only light coming from the hallway. The door was open. My vision was blurry and kind of kept going in and out. I remember looking up at MK's bed and on it, there sat a woman. I knew she was from the older times because she wore all black, and she had one of those bulky dresses and a black veil over her face. The way she was sitting, her peripheral vision would have been toward me. She sat up straight, both legs together, hands in her lap, as though she was in church. I guess she felt me look at her, because she slowly started turning her head toward me. I remember at that moment that I wasn't scared, but everything felt sad. The energy was sad. Her face looked sad. She already looked as if she was at a funeral. Anyway, as soon as her face got all the way around to look at me, my vision went black, and the next thing I remember is waking up in the morning. I told MK and her sister about it, but I think they didn't want to believe me. I also think, though, that something told them I wasn't joking. 
I went back over there a few more times, because that woman, although creepy, didn't make me feel unsafe. And to this day, I've always wondered what her story was. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brother's. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else, underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read General Store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair, staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-styled dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night. And if my memory serves me right, 
I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars, just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school, and he hands me the binoculars and says, Look at the cow pasture. Tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away, so that night my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. We had coyotes come through all the time, we knew what that looked like, and also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell, there was no blood or viscera, and the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moments scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. So, I live in a small town in the southwest of Scotland. One of those towns where if you don't know someone, you will definitely know one of their friends. In 2015, I moved into a flat or apartment with my two children and my partner. The flat seemed nice and it was in a quiet part of town. Needless to say, we were all really happy with the move. At the time, my eldest son Bobby was four and my youngest Derek was three. Soon after moving in, I started noticing strange things happening. For example, the washing machine turned itself on and off at the wall. Doors opened on their own. But the strangest incidents were yet to come. One night, when the kids were in bed, about six months after moving in, Bobby came running to the living room and said, Daddy, please could you come and tell the hand in my room to stop trying to play with my teddy bears? So, naturally, I went into his room and told this, what I thought was imaginary, hand off. About two weeks later, my son Bobby came to me again. With the complete matter-of-fact innocence of a child, he goes, Daddy, did you know there's a ghost in your attic? I didn't think much of it. Kids will be kids. The next day, I was at work, talking to a colleague about where we'd moved to. Out of nowhere, he goes, 
Hey, did you know that back in April of 2014, some young guy hung himself in your flat? Suddenly, Bobby talking about a ghost in the attic started to feel a lot more concerning. What blows my mind is that Bobby had never talked about ghosts before moving here. At the time, he didn't even know what an attic or a loft was. I did some digging and even spoke to a friend who's a local police officer. I asked him about the whole incident with the young guy, and he goes, Oh yeah, that's true. He hung himself in the attic up there. We still live in that house, and to this day, strange things happen from time to time. Most recently, the TV turned itself on and turned the volume up to full blast, all on its own. I was the only one home at the time. What's really strange is that my youngest son Derek has never mentioned anything ghostly. It's all very strange, but very real. I honestly don't know how to put this or where to begin. And now that I think of it, I don't know who would believe this, but it's true. This happened two years ago when I enlisted into the army and I did my basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. At the beginning of the cycle, it seemed normal. Nothing out of the ordinary until white phase had started. I will only share four experiences to avoid this being too long. So hopefully you at least enjoy the stories. Whether or not you believe me is up to you. Experience one. One day, I was a battle buddy for one of my friends who had passed out due to the heat, so he had to stay at the bay for a little while. We were on the other end of the bay that has 55 bunks in it. My roster number was 340 and he was 342. So we were sitting by our bunks talking about random stuff when out of the blue one of the locks on the 301's locker jingled out of nowhere. Now keep in mind we're the only ones in the bay let alone the entire company area, because the others are out training. We stop what we're talking about and he asks me to go check it out. I say no, so we check under the bunks and nobody's there. Experience two. The second incident happened one night when I woke up at about one in the morning. I slept on the bottom bunk and the way that I slept had my head facing the middle of the bay. In front of our bunks was a blue tape line where we would have to line up for different purposes. So I woke up and looked toward the middle and I thought I saw outlines of people walking back and forth. At least four or five people passed my bunk, or so I thought. I hopped up and threw on my boots and began to tow the line. Then the fire guard came up to me and asked me what I was doing. When I told him what I saw, he said that there was nobody else awake and I should get some sleep. Experience 3 This incident happened a few nights after the second one. Again, I woke up at about 1 o'clock in the morning, but this time it was different. I didn't see anybody walking around. Instead, I physically saw a shadow figure sitting at the edge of my bunk. I knew it wasn't one of the others because it was pitch dark the shadow, I mean. The figure was darker than dark. I just kind of froze up and tried getting the attention of the guy next to me, but he wasn't having it. Eventually, the figure faded away right in front of me, but it was still pretty creepy. This last experience, I'll tell you, isn't too serious, but it's still weird. One day I was in the latrine and I was shaving and getting ready for the day before anyone else had woken up. Then, randomly, all the paper towel machines, which are motion activated, went off one by one. I checked to see if anybody had come in, but I knew nobody did. I would have heard the door and footsteps, but I was just trying to convince myself that there was some kind of an explanation. These are four of the weird and creepy things that happened to me at Basic. For disclosure, I'm not crazy and... I also don't know how to explain any of this. I mainly give credit to it most likely being the stress getting to me. I'm not the only one who had experiences though. These are just mine. 
Even the drill sergeants had experiences of their own that they told us. So, are there ghost recruits wandering around the training areas? Maybe. My friend and I worked construction, and one night we were enjoying a break, just hanging out together. We had another friend with us, we'll call her Jen. My other construction friend we'll call Maggie. So Maggie and I were talking about some of the strange things that we've seen in houses. And Jen goes, hang on, my mom has the craziest story, let me call her. So Jen calls her mom and her mom begins to tell us this story of what keeps happening in her attic. Her mom goes, it's the darndest thing, but you know the light cord, the thing you pull to turn it on and off? It keeps tying itself into a knot with a circle hanging down from it. Never have been able to figure that out. As we're listening to the story, Maggie and I look at each other and our eyes say everything. We're both thinking about the same project that we worked on not that long ago, maybe a couple years. Hey, whereabouts is your house? Maggie asks. Jen's mom tells us, and we about freaked out. After Jen hung up the phone, she asks us what we're freaking out about. I finally got the words together to say, your mom's house was a construction site we worked on not long before you guys moved in. It needed some work after the previous owner left, I suppose. The thing is, she unalived herself in the attic by hanging herself from the light cord, using it as a noose. That was one of the strangest things we'd ever encountered. However, I was working on a site one time that was a full-on demo. It was this old, decrepit mansion in Maine. Well, as we're working, we found this old, dusty VHS tape in the wall. Obviously, we were curious, so we put it into a barely functioning VHS player to see what was on it. All it contained was several minutes of an old woman sitting in a chair in the middle of the basement, staring directly into the camera and breathing heavily. And then it cut off. I was probably 10 to 12 years old, and my friend, I'll call him Bill, and I, were going over to another friend's house, I'll call him Jake, for a sleepover. I'll keep this brief, but this has always stuck with me, and I felt like sharing. We were all hanging out in the living room in the late afternoon. I wanted a drink, so I walked into Jake's kitchen. When you walked in, there was a table to your immediate right. I think it was Jake's birthday or something, so there were some balloons tied to the chairs. I looked over and I saw an old man sitting in one of the chairs. At least I thought I did. I only saw him for a split second, and I assumed I was just seeing things. Never mentioned it to my friends because it was honestly just a, oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. An hour or so went by and Bill went to the kitchen for some food or whatever. When he came back, he told Jake and I that he saw a man sitting at the kitchen table. I got so excited because this was a damn sleepover and now we had ghosts involved. I told them that I thought I had seen the same thing earlier and Jake said it sounded like his dead grandfather. Later that night, Jake's dad was working at the kitchen table before going to his bedroom. Once he was out of there, I went back to get some food, and I saw him still sitting at the table. I literally turned to ask, didn't you just leave? But there was nobody there. Some other things happened after that, but I kind of chalked those things up to our overactive imaginations given the first thing. I have two reasons, though, to believe that this wasn't a ghost. Number one, maybe we mistook one of the balloons for a human head. Totally possible. Number two, 
Maybe I did tell my friends what I saw the first time, and I'm just blocking that part out of my memory. This would make what Bill said seem totally unbelievable, because he was younger than me and probably just wanted attention. But I'm 90% sure I never said anything to them, because I really didn't think anything of it when I first saw it. The balloon thing has been my main theory. I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in the paranormal. This is the only story I have that could have been paranormal. But it's really hard to tell what happened. My husband and I met a guy who used to work in our house. In conversation one day, he said, so have you met the ghosts yet? My husband started laughing and said, we sure have. We were a little bit skeptical as to whether we'd imagined the things that happened, but laborers working here have been very unsettled by some events, and in some cases, they've refused to come back. We've always lived in houses where strange things happen, but this one has really been a wild ride. It's very haunted. Noises, floorboards creaking with footsteps, bangs, doors opening, lights and sockets switching on and off, things moving, voices, shadows, it's crazy. He also told us some of the things that happened here. It's a very old house, and in recent years it was a home for addicts with new babies. A lot of serious, horrific trauma happened here. I cried when he told us about it. It's unsurprising to me, therefore, that the energy here is so charged. Knowing this, I thought that over the weekend I might light some candles and sage the house, and invite anything to leave that needs to go, though I suppose some will probably want to stay. I'd be interested to know what you would do here. Our family and friends have said to move out, but we like it here. We don't have any bad experiences, really. We're not frightened. And, as far as advice goes, I don't really want any advice on exorcisms or fleeing the house. The worst thing we've ever experienced was a disembodied groaning noise. It was very human and very strange. But if it was intended to frighten us, it didn't. I raised my eyebrows at my husband and then carried on working. Last night, my husband and I opened doors and windows all throughout the house. We started in the cellar and worked our way up through the house. There are 28 rooms or spaces, so it took us ages. I used white sage sticks, tea light candles, and a bowl each to carry the candles in, which were gifts from loved ones and sentimental to us. As we moved through the house, I just talked, asking any spirits who didn't respect us or wanted to harm us to leave our house, that this was our home and we wouldn't tolerate it and that if anybody wished to stay, they could, but they had to respect us and treat us with kindness and we would do the same. In the rooms where we felt the most oppressive energy, one bedroom in particular, I spent a while talking out loud to any spirits trapped here because of the traumatic house history. I said that they were free to move on now and to go and find their loved ones. Who knows if it did anything, but I felt like we had to try. So I did it with belief and conviction. My husband had a strange interaction in the cellar where the sage was knocked from his hand, but he remained firm and told them that they had to leave and they weren't allowed to touch him. Our cat was avidly watching the house spirit cat as usual and following it around. And then he seemed to be watching and following things with his eyes through the kitchen to the back door. We were just watching, fascinated. I said thank you, just in case they were leaving, so we'll see if things get better. We'll see if they seem more peaceful. I certainly slept very well last night, so fingers crossed. Redditor Arctic Fox of the North came to the Ghost Stories subreddit to tell not one, but three ghostly tales. 
Let's hear what happened. So I've wanted somewhere to share my experiences and figured here was as good as any. My encounters with ghosts have all been pretty short so far, so I thought I'd just put them all into one story. To this day, I'm convinced that my workplace is haunted. I had my first encounter while at work one evening. It was a little late and a coworker and I were staying behind to clean up after the others had left for the day, which is something we regularly do. I was going about my business and cleaning up, but when we were done and heading back to the sluice, my coworker and best friend noticed that I had a pretty large oil stain in the shape of a handprint on my upper back. At first, I was suspicious of my coworker, thinking that she had placed her hand on my back, but we later compared her hand to the one that was on my clothing, and her hand was way too small. Thinking back on it, I had never felt anybody put their hand on my back while I was working. That and the stain was so visible that if somebody had actually put their hand on my back, they would have needed to keep it there for a while and while I was moving around. I find this pretty freaky. I still have no clue where it came from or how it got there. My second and most recent encounter happened two days ago. The weather was pretty bad and the power ended up going out, halting production. The foreman and assistant foreman told us to go wait in the sluice but it got a bit crowded, so we eventually shuffled into the cafeteria. My best friend and I were made to go clean up like usual, but since it was almost pitch black, we couldn't see anything, and thus we only finished off with all the machines the best we could. When we got back into the sluice, we both saw somebody standing by the racks where we would usually hang our work clothes, but when we got around the corner and out from behind one of the shoe racks, there was nobody there. We looked into the foreman's office that's attached to the stairwell and looked into the other sluice, which is right beside the one we use, but no one was there. The weirdest part is that we both saw two different ghosts. I saw a short and stubby figure while my best friend saw a tall and lanky one. By far the weirdest experience that I've ever had. But the other one, happened a while ago. I was visiting my best friend and we were watching The Conjuring, as you do. She had turned on some candles for some ambiance. Well, while we were watching the movie, one of the candles she lit almost went out, while the other one was standing perfectly still. What I find scary is that the candle only moved whenever something happened on screen. This candle was on a shelf, mind you. I got so creeped out that I eventually just blew out the candle. Something I should note is that my best friend has an attachment, her words, not mine, and now I'm pretty sure something has latched onto me as well. Her house has this old sword that she says has the souls of all of its victims trapped inside, even the original owner of the sword. She's experienced way more spooky things than I have so I suppose she has more authority on this particular subject. Nevertheless, it's kind of scary, even though she always assures me that the ghosts at her home aren't harmful, but they do like to mess around. Somehow, that's less than comforting. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area in a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse, even to this day, and I'm in my late 20s. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, stayed in the guest room so I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, 
and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that somebody was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. I didn't, but instead I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to call for my sister. The boy continued to stare until she turned on the light. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen, and she started to see what I meant. Little things, such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open. Thankfully, the dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband, who worked the night shift, to be coming for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway and just staring as he did before. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You'd feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything told me not to. So, I would face the wall until I would almost fall asleep and then feel somebody sit on the bed with my sister, dead asleep. I knew it wasn't her. She also started seeing him standing in her driveway, staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The boy started showing up everywhere. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment, midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist and she dropped the groceries. We left them until morning we were so scared. The last and final time was unfortunately all for me. My sister worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away and I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's a long story for another day. Anyway, she came to pick me up since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend. I went after lunch to help clean up the place. She said that was fine by her, but just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill, drink some coffee, hang out and text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me in there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. John was passed out. He wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running and screams. Directly in front of me, I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, right in my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard him again. She says it's been peaceful ever since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time. I'm guessing that's where he is. 
and he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope that he's at peace, and whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again. I am Puerto Rican, and I live in Brooklyn, but when I was young, I often spent summers in my grandmother's house in Yauco, Puerto Rico. She had a lot of land deep in the mountains, so deep that roads would go off into the wilderness through narrow mountain passes where cliffs were just a few inches off the tire driving in pitch black. If a car came in the opposite direction, either they or you would have to drive in reverse until you found a place to pass each other. It was scary. The property has been with my family for a long time, and my family has been in Yauco as far back as anyone can recall. I used to spend a lot of time with my great-grandfather, Papito, who farmed the land and took care of some cows. He was very old, and he was nearly 100% Taino indigenous Puerto Rican. From him, I would hear stories about the Indios who lived in the wilderness when he was young, who were not culturally assimilated into colonial society after hundreds of years of Spanish occupation. My family would often hide and harbor the culturally wild Puerto Ricans, culturally indigenous, because if Spanish locals found them, Los Matan, they would kill them. I had my first brush with mortality there at age six or so, crushing the jelly bean sized eggs of salamanders I found in the brush and watching the pink underdeveloped hatchling run for cover on instinct. My grandmother told me that what I had done was very wrong and I instantly knew why. I was filled with cold shame and I cried. Papito told me about strange flying discs he would see coming to the mountains and submerging into the lake. He told me about the spirits in the valley that you could hear them, and to be careful walking around the roads of the mountains at night on my way home from his house to my grandmother's. He taught me how to control a bull with its horns and how to ride it. He did a whistle only he could do when he wanted to gain the attention of an animal on the mountain that made them either follow him, go where he directed them, or just settle down. He told me about the legend of Diego Salcedo, which took place there in Yauco. When he was almost 100, Papito was dying, and all of our family came to see him. He was a link to an old time, and so many people in Yauco knew him. They all went to his house. Uncles, aunts, cousins, people from nearby, all gathered at his house on the top of the hill. I was too young to be present for his passing. I sort of didn't understand what was going on at the time. I was sent down to my grandmother's house to wait for the proceedings to be over. The sun was going down. The mountains were like shadows rising around me. Walking alone, I started to hear animals all about, crying out. Wild dogs all over the mountains. Chickens were making a ruckus. The pigs in the lower valley were screaming almost like humans. The cows were howling in a way that I can only describe as similar to Cat Stark from Game of Thrones when Rob died. Every single non-human thing in the mountain within earshot was wailing in a fashion that I've never heard before or since. As a little kid, you can imagine how frightening that was, especially because I was all alone. I hid in the house, looking out the window, waiting for my grandmother and listening to the animals cry. I was especially sensitive to sound then, as it had been a time in my life where I was often sick and constantly on the medication amoxicillin, which I was allergic to. It created this sort of overwhelming extrasensory sound experience. At some point, all the animals stopped making noise and I was thankful. Before bed, I asked my grandmother what had happened, why all of the animals were making that sound. She told me that Papito had just died and that all of the animals on the mountain had realized the powerful being that protected it for so long was gone, that they had seen his spirit pass and it was sensible that this change would affect them very deeply. 
My grandmother's perspective was that the animals just know these things. I couldn't sleep. I went outside late at night, curious and scared out of my wits, thinking about the spirits that may be out in the darkness of the mountain wilderness, thinking about that terrible, painful lamentation that was embodied by animals crying like people. I went close to the edge of one of the small nearby cliffs that hung over the endless darkness. I squatted and listened. I heard a sound that scared me, a feral cry in the darkness. I don't know what dog it was or if it was a dog at all, but it was certainly too close and I was by myself. It howled and yelped and I regretted coming outside. I was sort of frozen there, afraid to move but afraid to stay. I wouldn't dare call out for my grandmother. I would be scolded for coming out and wandering around at night. She probably wouldn't hear me anyway. A moment later, I heard that whistle that Papito used to do, out in the darkness. The howling stopped. As a child, I didn't think, that couldn't be Papito, he's dead. Like any adult in their right mind would think. I just thought, it's Papito, it had to be. No one else could do that. No one knew how to whistle that way in my family, and it was only us for miles around on the mountain. Where the sound came from would have been impossible for any person to be. Not even during the daytime could they be there. It was deep inside of the wilderness on the severe cliffside. But I knew he was there just the same. I'm sure that at that age, the line between life and death was blurred. Yauco is the area where the chief of Taino lived. It is also where the rebellion began against the Spanish, with the drowning of the conquistador Diego Salcedo. Many of the surviving Taino escaped into the mountains of Yauco and lived in secrecy there for a long time, hiding their lifestyle behind some of the more assimilated natives, like Papito. They say the Taino are extinct, but that cannot be. I knew some of them, and I am one too, if only a little bit. This happened in mine and my husband's first house, several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery. For the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving nightlights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, and he whispered, What the hell? while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m. and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. 
I did, and he handed me another, smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room, and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly, and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911, and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door, so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable, still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first. I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved, and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room, or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out, saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better, but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time I was wary of the room though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. But I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate, probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go now, back to his mom's. Then we somehow just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there, sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. 
My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I am wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled, and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside, he's got a handful of stuff, and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not scared of anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're gonna stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place, it's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys and haven't really looked back other than to talk about remember when, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house, not even a little bit. The reason that I'm writing this now and not before is because I was only reminded of this the other day. I was driving to the store with my son and he wanted me to listen to a song. I don't even remember the words. I just remember that the tune brought me back to a place, a place that I had tucked away in my memory in hopes of forgetting. Now, I can't get that old lady's mouth out of my head. This happened in 1987. I'm sure about the date because of the Whittier earthquake. It just so happens that at that very moment, I was painting a wall in the dining room a different color. That's when it hit. I ended up streaking paint across the wall as I ran over to hold our overly large fish tank from falling off of this stupidly flimsy stand we had it on. This took place in Hacienda Heights, California. My boyfriend at the time wasn't really welcome at my mother's house because she couldn't shake this bad feeling about him. So being young and dumb, I moved out of her house and into a place that I found down the street with him. I wish I had listened to her. It was a small one bedroom bungalow. At first we were getting along just fine, but it seemed like things changed as the months passed and we started fighting more and more. I thought it was odd that I, Susie Homemaker, didn't even want to make that house a home. It was just a weird vibe, and it got darker the longer we stayed. As you walk in the partial glass front door, on the left, there were two white window pane doors on the built-in bookcases on both sides of a fireplace, then the dining room, and in the back was the kitchen. The bedroom was on the right. We couldn't afford a bed frame, so our full-size mattress was on the floor, under the window, 
and that was the only thing there besides the clock. There was an uneasiness in that bedroom that I couldn't put my finger on. I felt very depressed in there. Oh, little things happened throughout the house from the moment we moved in, but we just laughed it off until it was no longer funny. It seemed like when we were at odds with each other, it intensified in a dark way. Oftentimes my boyfriend would just leave and I was alone, sometimes for days. And I thought that he did it on purpose because he knew that I was scared to be there alone. At first I was fine, not scared of anything. Until one of those nights, I was sleeping and I was jolted up by an extremely loud bang that left my ears ringing. I jumped up and at first I looked out the front window, thinking that it was something outside, but the streets were still. I checked the house, but there was nothing out of place. The next night it happened again, louder than before. Only this time I glanced at the clock before checking the house. It was five o'clock AM on the dot and my room was freezing. I tried to get back to sleep, but I heard muffled wails of a woman. I literally had to lift my head from the pillow to listen, but nobody was around. The next day, my boyfriend came home and with a few words and some hand-picked flowers, all was stupidly forgiven. I told him what had happened, but he shrugged it off, telling me that it could have been a backfire or the pipes, and I bought it. One early evening after dinner, we were going to watch TV on the couch in the living room, and I excused myself to go to the bathroom. I kept hearing him yelling out things to me, but I couldn't really make out what he was saying. I opened the door and looked at him. He turned absolutely pale, and he was crawling backwards on the couch with wide eyes. Then he leaped up and ran into the kitchen, looking around and checking the back door. He came out, saying that the door was locked from the inside. After he calmed down and I could understand him, he told me that he was talking to me in the kitchen. He asked me why I was putting a granny house dress on and was asking for snacks, and he was getting a bit upset that I didn't answer him. I had no answers. There had been a few times where we both saw what looked like a teenaged boy sitting on the front stoop, sometimes holding his head in his hands, but when we approached him, it was like he was never there. I pointed out faces in the glass panes of the bookcase that looked like they were talking to us while we were watching TV. They were just reflections, but they were reflections of something that wasn't in the room. Their features were outlined by the flickering light from the TV. But after a while, the faces became more defined. In the beginning, my boyfriend thought I was making it all up until he saw it for himself. We heard banging on the bathroom door, like somebody was banging with their fist, even when we weren't in there, and an older guy's voice saying, Ah, come on, sending us running outside a couple of times, then feeling stupid sitting outside, so we went in and stayed spooked for the rest of the day. I called the landlord to ask him if something had happened there or if he could make it stop. But before I could even open my mouth, he was asking if I was calling to complain about something he had no control over. In the background, I heard his wife say, is that the young couple? They want to move, do they? Well, there goes another one. It sounded like this had happened to them a lot before, and that really got my blood boiling. Why would they rent this place to us without even a heads up? Realizing that they would be of no immediate help, I just hung up on him. I couldn't move, I had no money, and my mother for sure wouldn't let me move back in as long as I was with my boyfriend. We lived there for at least four months when our relationship started to spin out of control. He was being forceful and demanding and drinking a lot more. One night he asked me to pick him up, so I did. And somehow I ended up with a broken arm because I didn't want him to drive my car drunk. I had to beg him to shift gears so that I could drive to the ER because he was tired. And after the hospital, I was exhausted and I just wanted to sleep. So I went to the bedroom while he opted to lay on the couch and watch TV. 
The next thing I know, he's grabbing his stuff, saying that he's not staying there anymore, and walking out, leaving me there alone with a broken arm. Wow. I remember that it was a warm night, but it was raining. So I laid on the couch with only the screen door closed so that I could hear the rain. The lights went out, which freaked me out even more. So I put candles on the coffee table and one on the bookcase and sat back down on the couch. I was too afraid to sleep in the bedroom. I sat there and saw those faces and one was an old lady. She was frowning and her mouth was moving like she was trying to over enunciate to tell me something or yell at me. Her face got bigger, like she was coming closer to the glass and then back. She kept waving her finger at me. Her gray hair was straight and put back with a headband. Her mouth was just going on opening and closing and the candlelight glistened on her bottom teeth. Her teeth looked a little, I don't know, long and old, if that makes any sense. Then there was a middle-aged man who didn't look directly at me. He looked aggravated, but not at me, more like at everything and everyone. And then a crying teenager. His face was so full of despair. I could make out the words, please, and no, no, no. And then he put his hand on his face. Looking at him brought tears to my eyes, and my heart felt so very heavy. It dawned on me that this was the kid on our doorstep. I must have sat there for hours with the blankets up to my nose until the lights came back on and I finally fell asleep. The next morning, I walked down to the corner store and I called my mother, who was happy to find out that I was ready to come home. Before I handed the keys over, my mother had some words with the landlord. He told her that he had the place blessed before I moved in and that he was really hoping that it had worked. He also told my mom that he bought the place already haunted. All he knew from digging was that it was two bungalows together, but one burnt down. But the one that I was renting was the one where an old lady lived, whose grown son had come upon hard times due to his alcoholism. He lost his wife and couldn't keep a job, so he and his teenage son moved into her place with her. His son was so unstable that he found a gun in the house and ended up shooting himself in the bedroom. His grandmother had died from a heart attack not long after. He didn't know what happened to the man. Talk about a roundabout. I don't know why that tune, or maybe the light reflecting off the rain on my windshield made me think about that old lady's mouth, but it did. Now I understand a little more as to why I hate reflective things in my home. Back in 2000, when I was 20, a friend of mine, a 19-year-old female, decided she wanted to get an apartment and asked if I would be her roommate. I didn't really need a place to stay, but I decided to do it anyway. We moved to a nice apartment complex right next to and behind the house where my aunt saw her dead ex-boyfriend. The place was nice and newer, so the thought of it being haunted never crossed my mind. I didn't even experience anything until my roommate got homesick a month in and had to move back in with her folks, leaving me there alone for three months. It started with the lights coming on by themselves. I would go to bed, always turning the lights off and always closing my bedroom door. I was meticulous about the lights because that's how I was raised. I would go to bed and at some point, I'd open my eyes and see light coming in under the door. I thought my roommate came home, so I would get out of bed excited to see her, only to discover that I was still alone and the dining room or bathroom light would be on. Then the knocking started. Right after I would lay down, there would be three loud knocks on my bedroom door. Again, thinking my roommate came home, I'd get up to greet her, 
only to find that I was still entirely alone. A week or so before Christmas, my roommate and I went out gift shopping and went back to the apartment to wrap everything. When we were done, we were both standing at the door, checking to see if we had everything before leaving. The apartment was completely quiet, and we heard this very clearly. My acoustic guitar, which I had leaned up against the wall in my bedroom with the pick stuck between three strings, was plucked, each string in succession, then slid along the wall until hitting the floor. We just looked at each other, then walked to my bedroom to find the guitar on the floor with the pick still stuck between the strings. Those strings had been plucked, meaning the pick had been used and then replaced when done. At Christmas, during a party with her and some other friends at the apartment, the VCR turned itself off. It did that one or two other times while I was living there, but never before or after. For Christmas, my girlfriend got me a guitar tablature book for Pink Floyd's The Wall. One night, I sat on the floor of my bedroom learning how to play a song in it. When I was done, I put the pick in the strings and set my guitar up on the wall. But instead of closing the book as I normally did, I left it open and went to bed. Just after laying down, I heard the pages in the book flipping on their own. It was a thick book, but the song I had been learning was somewhere in the middle. I figured that the weight of the pages made it change pages on its own. But when they stopped flipping, I got curious and got up to look. The pages had stopped flipping on the song, Hey You, and when I read the title, I got chills and shut the book, pleaded with the ghost to let me sleep, and went back to bed. While laying there, I realized that if the pages had flipped on their own from the weight, they would have gone in the other direction, away from that song. After that, I started calling the ghost Pink. Anytime something happened, I would just say, Oh, hey, Pink. But one night, I had been out with a friend until around 2 o'clock in the morning. When I opened my door, I stepped in, and I could feel the ghost standing there. I said, Oh, hi, Pink and I could feel the energy go through me and out of the apartment. That's when I figured it didn't like being called that, which didn't stop me from saying it. Shortly after, my roommate came back and stayed the rest of the lease. Not much happened then. I figured if an entire house could be haunted, then surely an entire apartment building could be. I wanted to ask my neighbors if they ever experienced anything, but I never did. And actually, I never really talked to them at all. To answer some questions you might have, my roommate and I were and still are really good friends. We never dated, never slept together. She was also really good friends with my girlfriend, and it was my girlfriend who told her to ask me to move in with. Also, I've known since I was around 10 or so that I could feel ghosts, but usually only when standing right where they were. If I stand with them long enough, I usually get an image in my head of what they look like, as well as their mood, in a few instances, I've had them communicate with me like that, their words coming to me as thoughts or images, usually the latter. I typically don't tell people this, because they usually don't believe me, and I would rather not go through with the ridicule and name-calling. However, with Pink, I never figured out who or what it was. I always felt that it was a male, but I didn't know. I still wonder about it from time to time. This is a pretty tame story compared to some other things I've heard, but I think about these experiences all the time, so I thought I'd share them. My husband and I own our home. It's fairly new, built in 2006, and only one couple has lived in it before us. As far as I know, nothing bad has ever happened here. The first experience was when I was home alone with my children. My youngest was asleep, and my oldest was coloring at the table in the kitchen. It was the middle of the day, so the windows are open and no lights are turned on. 
I'm in the kitchen putting away dishes, crouched down to put a pot under the bottom cabinet, when I hear the click of the light switch and the kitchen lights turn on. I turn around fully expecting my husband to be home. He isn't. Creepy, but no big deal. Months later, both of my kids are in the nursery while I'm taking laundry out of the dryer. Even though I can see into the nursery, I can't see my kids because they're playing near the bed, which is against the wall. I hear my son jumping on the bed, and I keep telling him, don't jump on the bed, be careful of your sister. I do this a few times until I get a little frustrated, and I say, don't jump, in the classic parent tone. Directly in my ear, I hear a man's voice in a loud whisper say, don't jump. I immediately dropped the clothes and ran into the room. But of course, no one was there except my kids. A week after that, I walk next to our closet to see all of my husband's hangers swaying back and forth. I never feel threatened or nervous in my home, except for when these instances happen. I tell my husband about them and he says he sees weird things all the time, but never tells me because he doesn't want to upset me. So yeah, I kind of hate it.